My grandfather kept an ancient storybook hidden that tells a secret of the stars. I didn't really know my grandparents very well, but that's because I grew up in the States and they remained in Tokyo when we left. When he passed away, I got the news via FaceTime. My mom was in tears because it was so sudden. I was kind of numb to the whole thing. Busy with college and making sure I could work to handle the rising debt I was acquiring in San Francisco, their death didn't impact as much as I guess it should have when she showed me the obituary. Hikaru Watson, age 76. It was like looking at the picture of a stranger. How was I supposed to grieve when he had never made himself a part of my life? Truthfully, I wasn't paying attention until Ma asked for my dorm room number. That is quite an odd request, I told her. She told me there were a few things that he wanted me to have from the old country. What is it? Old sweaters or something? I asked. Ma shrugged, clearly still struggling with the tragedy. I didn't wish to cause her any more hardship, so I gave her the info and thought nothing more of it. Four days later, a package arrived. Covered in postage from all across the world, Grandfather had certainly gone through a lot of effort to send whatever was inside. I placed it on my firm mattress and used my car keys to open the little package. There was wrapping paper inside with a note attached to it. Written in Grandfather's Japanese. I placed it aside, deciding to translate it later and unwrap the item inside the box. It was some kind of children's storybook, written entirely in ancient Japanese, probably even older than the kind that Grandfather was familiar with. It wasn't too heavy, but clearly very fragile and I immediately wondered why he had sent me something like this. Placing the book down carefully, I got on my phone and used Google to translate his handwritten note to the best of my ability. I know it's shameful that I have never learned my mother tongue, but honestly there has never been a need. My dear Akio-chan, I am old and dying. I miss the days of my childhood when I could hold you and bounce you on my knee and tell you these fanciful stories and your eyes would twinkle. You remember nothing of this, of course, taken from me far too young. Ever since I have been unable to reach you and tell you there is more to this fable than meets the eye. I give it to you so that you may learn the truth about your family's heritage. Do not tell anyone or all will be lost. It was signed at the bottom and he even included a thumbprint in ink as a seal, perhaps his way of verifying that he really did send it. The note confounded me more than the book. I did not have any memory of life in Japan, nor was I aware that my grandfather had been trying to contact me for years. I instinctively started to dial my mom, but then I looked at the translation again. Grandpa sounded paranoid, perhaps delusional. I didn't really know what his mental state was at the end. But what if there was some truth to the words? I hadn't spoken to Ma in a while since coming to the States, and while I felt she loved me, this was all very new and strange. Maybe it was sixth sense or something, but I didn't finish the call. I instead decided to take the storybook to one of my professors. Dr. Calhe majored in archaeology and when I explained what I had, he was instantly intrigued and agreed to me after class the next day. When he saw the book, he was immediately impressed and told me that even without starting to do carbon dating, it was clear that this book was over 200 years old. He seemed shocked my grandfather had chosen to no donate it to a museum and a little disappointed that I decided to hang on to it for now. How long do you think it would take to translate? I asked. He told me that his specific studies couldn't help, but maybe if he took a few snapshots of different pages, he might be able to get some of his colleagues to help out. I thought that was harmless and we chose a few of the pages that had more text on them than illustration, and once I was finished I decided to call my girlfriend and go out to dinner. Out of caution for the book's value, I stopped by my dorm and placed it in an old safe that had been handed down from another relative. Ironic that these two antiques were now guarding one another, I thought. During our meal, I told her the interesting find and she was in awe of the story. Her first reaction was to suggest that I attempt to sell it. I knew that if it really was old that could be enough to cover my college and perhaps have some left over. It was a tempting thought but it made me feel guilty. Come on, it's an heirloom. Besides, Grandpa seemed to think that it would help me learn more about my family history. That intrigued her more especially because she wondered if it was true why my mother hadn't already told me the story herself. Not sure yet. I'm sure it will amount to nothing though. Probably just a harmless fairy tale, I laughed. That night, 
I was surprised to find that my professor had already emailed me the first parts of the story. Immediately I began to read, it was an interesting account from all the way back in the 7th century. The Star Princess Just as the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, the great warriors protect our lands from all evil great and far. Namor Watson was one such samurai of the lowest family in the remotest part of the kingdom. I paused as I reread the name of the warrior in the book. Watson. My family name. I kept reading, slightly more interested now as the story told of what happened to Watson. One day, while in the midst of a duel with his aging father, Namoro saw something in the distant sky. It was a shooting star he thought at first. Then he saw that it was a falling boat. A chariot from the heavens. I saw the artistic depiction of the strange ship that my ancestors claimed to have seen and noted that the professor claimed it bore a striking resemblance to other ancient works, particularly a drawing from 1844. He sent me the link and I did realize there was a bit of a similarity except the one in the storybook looked more like an egg than a spinning top. Alongside the link was a word. Atsorobium. The email ended with a promise that he would continue the translation tomorrow. Meanwhile, I did some internet research of my own, discovering that the strange ship was considered an old legend from the Kono tribe and related to a fisherman from Gogo Island. That was a name I recognized. It was the place my mother grew up near. Grandfather claimed our family had been there for generations. My phone rang, disturbing my research. It was my mother. Akio, are you awake at this hour? she asked. Her voice sounded a bit concerned. I'm all right, Ma. What is wrong? Why are you calling? I asked. Nakia called me. She said that you found something interesting from Pa's things, Ma said. For a moment I froze, realizing that I had never considered my girlfriend would contact her. It's nothing, Ma, I mumbled. Akio, do not lie to me. A mother can always tell when her son is lying. It was a book, wasn't it? How did she know that? I said nothing, and I heard her sigh heavily on the phone. Your grandfather has been obsessed with that for ages. I really didn't want you roped into his nonsense, she whispered. Is that why you kept him from contacting me? I asked. There was a long pause, long enough for me to suspect that there was more to the story she was withholding from me. The book is meaningless, Akio. Don't waste your time with it, she told me. I paused, a few things feeling wrong about the entire situation. So, you called me up at one o'clock in the morning to warn me to just get rid of a children's storybook? She didn't answer this time so I prodded her and remarked, What exactly is so important about it, Ma? It should have been burned long ago. Then she hung up the phone. I laid against the headboard of my bed, a bit baffled by her words. Was she frightened by what I might learn? Or was there something else going on that I didn't understand? Somehow despite those troubling thoughts, I managed to sleep. When I did, I dreamed of my ancestor from that ancient story. I was on a war-torn battlefield. I could see many warriors dressed in the shining armor of the samurais of old. Iron and leather and painted with familiar clan colors from Japan, the warriors were all fighting each other to the death in a war that made the ground red with blood. Not Sino, though barely had anything to protect himself with and an army was coming down to destroy his home. All of his traditional armor had been stripped and it seemed like he had nothing to stop this strange enemy that pushed through the land like a flood. To his side, I saw a strange young girl with pale skin and dark hair. She had eyes that were as bright as the sun and she was whispering something to him but I didn't understand. His long katana was glowing with blood and filled with twinkling stars as he closed his eyes and then put on a helmet. He turned his blade to me, his eyes now as black as a demon's. The stars awaken. Behold the darkest day, he said as he ran his blade straight through my belly. I awoke with a cold sweat and instinctively grabbed my stomach, pulling my sheets back to look down and make sure I wasn't injured. Just a dream. But it felt so real. My laptop was still on, and my professor had emailed me the next part of the story. Meet with me once you finish. A few of my colleagues are interested in learning more. A note attached to the translation said, I opened the PDF and felt a chill run down my spine. 
there was an illustration of an ancient battle of the Kano clan against an army of shadows from the sky. Demons that were coming to kill a young woman that matched the girl I saw in my dreams. What had happened in that tale made me begin to question my reality. Natsuno was not strong or brave, but the star princess gave him both. Promises of a future kingdom that would rule all the kingdoms of earth. They were in love, but the star demons did not approve. They sought her blood and the blood of the entire clan. Natsuno would have to face them alone to protect his family. Natsuno was given the powers of the stars and struck down millions of the demons with a single blade. He did not falter. But as a result of his strength, he lost his mortal life. As the last demon tried to strike him down, Natsuno was given a final task. To give birth to his son, sinless and pure. The depiction of the man bursting open and a child hovering and glowing from his bowels didn't make this feel like it was a child's story, but rather a gory war story with a strange supernatural ending. Had this been what would happen next in the dream? Why had I depicted these scenes so vividly in my subconscious when I had never seen them? Reading this story felt like I was opening a door in my mind. Some memory I never remembered being planted in my mind. Again, at the end of the PDF, my professor reminded me to meet him that afternoon for more discussion. His urgency told me there had to be something else he had uncovered and my troubled dreams made me eager to find out what it could be. I met him at a library alongside three men that I didn't know. I was actually surprised when I saw that they were all Japanese and instinctively I gave them the customary bow for their culture. Akio, I'm glad you could make it. These are associates I have contacted about your find. They came as soon as they heard of its importance, my professor said excitedly. For a moment I panicked. I had hoped he wouldn't involve anyone else, but these men all seemed dignified and reasonable, so I sat with them as they began to talk. They told me that they had determined that the book Grandfather had in his possession was from 1805, probably crafted directly on Gogo Island, the first man said. The second man was a bit older and coughed into his hand. As I'm sure you no doubt have realized, this is a priceless artifact that belongs to the people of Japan. We would like to return it to Tokyo immediately. There would be a small finder's fee. After all, Ikaro ensured that this story would be able to endure the test of time, the third man said. I paused, my eyes flickering for a moment. What did you say? I asked. The first man repeated the offer, saying they wished to offer compensation for finding this national treasure. No. Not that. You mentioned my grandfather's name. How do you know that? I asked. The three men exchanged glances and even my professor seemed a bit puzzled, asking if I ever met these men before. Those were the last words he ever spoke. The second man had taken out a gun and shot him straight between the eyes. The sound was so loud it made my ears ring. I was in such shock, I didn't realize they were pointing the weapon at my head next. The man was mouthing words and shouting, but I couldn't hear him at first. My flight or fight instinct took over and I kicked the table up, pushing the three men backward. As I looked down at my professor's dead eyes, I mumbled an apology and ran. Immediately I could hear the faint rumble of their feet. They were pursuing me. I ran to the second floor of the library, weaving between the aisles until I found a broom closet and hid within. The shuffling of feet eventually subsided and I knew that they were gone. After a few more moments, my racing heart began to calm and I looked down at my shirt that was now covered in my professor's blood. What was so important about that book they would want to kill for it? Once I left the library, I felt that I had a target on my back and I didn't even know why. Those men were hunting for me and I needed to get into my professor's office and find the rest of the notes he had managed to make. I made my way to campus that evening, calling Nakia to help. I promised her a cut of the reward, lying and saying I was selling the book to a museum. So it's really worth a lot, huh? She asked as we went down the corridor toward the professor's office. More than you could possibly imagine. Now can you shimmy the lock or not? I asked as I kept watch. The school was mostly empty of students at this hour, but I felt the need to be paranoid. Thankfully, she was able to get it open in only a few minutes. She asked me what we were supposed to be looking for as we flipped on the lights. I scanned the room and saw a few pages of notes on his desk, rifling through them. Then I noticed a few interesting news articles. 
the headlines made me pause. Doomsday Cult Responsible for Death of 13 in Subway Incident Leader of Cult Claims Divine Judgment Was Given from Above End of World by 1997 Last members of the cult were executed for crimes. Some suspect splinter groups still exist to await the return. I wasn't sure what all of it meant, but I saw that he had made a small board that connected claims by this cult leader to the story of the Atsorbian. Able to float on air? Seeing visions of heavenly women that were giving him direct guidance? And the beast of biblical revelation was said to be an invasion that only he could smite with the power of his ancestors. My ancestors, I realized as I finally found the notes of Natsuno's story. The child, a son of man and of gods, was hidden from the world. The star princess claimed that his lineage would bring about the end of the world when the return brought him into the light again. And she would come back as well. There was a depiction of the ancestor, glowing in an ethereal way along with a heavenly woman watching over him. For some reason it made me feel very uneasy to look down at the ancient translation. What did it all mean for me? Akio, isn't this your grandfather? I heard my girlfriend ask as she held up a picture of the trial of the cult leader from a Tokyo newspaper. In the background at the court, I saw Ikaro. 2018, only a few years ago. Why was he there? Nakia asked. I'm not sure, but I think I know who can give me the answers, I said as I realized that going to my mother was the only option I had. Nakia, you must come with me. It isn't safe here, I told her. She seemed frightened by the idea that a mere children's book could hold such power. People had been killed already because of it. I think it's telling a dark secret and they don't want it to come to light, I explained. She pushed me away, clearly troubled. She told me we should destroy it and let it die alongside my grandfather. I was surprised by her boldness, but the idea did make a certain amount of sense. And maybe the people that were coming after me would stop if we destroyed it. Meet me at my house tonight. We can burn it and then just forget all about this, she said as she kissed me. I grabbed the notes from my professor's desk and rushed home to get the book. Honestly, I wasn't sure it was going to be safe anywhere until it was gone. As I traveled, I felt constantly followed or watched. Suddenly, everyone around me no longer seemed trustworthy. As I traveled to Nakia's house, I listened to more notes relating to the Star Princess, and it troubled me. Many claim that ancestors from the clan related to Natsuno are descended from the Star Child itself. The warrior that was born from heaven that will cause the end of the world. The Star Princess, some believers testify, still walks among us immortal. And there are shadows among men that do her will. The demons from heaven, some theorists claim, were her own people. They saw the danger of the child, the danger of her arrival in the Atsorbian asterisk. Her ancestors are a threat to all mankind and must be eliminated, some extremists have proclaimed. The words were stunning to read. If they were true, did this explain why those men wanted me dead? Was Natsuno a harbinger of evil? And if Grandfather had learned this secret, why hasn't he tried to stop this ages ago? What had changed in recent years? As soon as I got there, Nakia pulled me inside asking if I had the book. Yes, but honestly I'm not sure about destroying it anymore. It feels like this has more secrets than just my family, I told her. Nakia disagreed, insisting that it would only bring bad luck and try to snatch my pack from my hands. I asked her how she could be so quick to destroy such an important artifact. What I have read might change the shape of history as we know it, I told her. She apologized and admitted she was just nervous to lose me, especially after what had happened at the library. She promised to not pressure me as we sat down and I examined the last few chapters of the book. Without a translator it was hard to guess what was happening. I saw the strange dark creatures from the stars swarming across the surface of the earth. And I saw the glowing woman from ancient times emerging from the ground. Except this time it was plainly obvious the demons were coming from her. So she had become their host? Or was she the cause of the problem all along? I think we might have gotten this story wrong. I think this visitor from ancient times infected mankind, waiting to spread her evil across generation after generation, I whispered. I looked up to see what my girlfriend had to say, but she had gone to the next room, so I put the book down and followed her in there, surprised to see that she was undressing. 
She insisted I come to bed with her and pulled me close, kissing me tenderly. I guessed it had been the recent string of events that had caused this sudden passion, but only a few moments later I was proven wrong. She was reaching for something in her cabinet, and at first I thought it was a condom. Then I saw a syringe, filled with strange black pus. I fumbled backward as she grabbed it and realized that this rendezvous was never about helping me at all. Who are you? Are you involved in this too? Holding the syringe close to her body, her voice changed and she claimed that she needed to kill me to protect my children. As long as the heirs of Natsuno were alive, her prodigy were a danger. Her eyes rolled back and began to glow. Her hair turned white and her body burst with stars and strange tendrils of fire. She was the star princess. She told me she had hunted me and my family for ages, trying to find every last member and kill them all. The only ones that still knew of her secret. And then she lunged to attack. She was so strong, I doubt even ten men could hold her down. Somehow I managed to break free and ran toward the living room, grabbing the book and running to the door. Nakia was right behind me, using her superhuman powers to pull me down and slam me to the ground. I was sure that I would likely die in the next few moments if I didn't act quickly. Her teeth were dripping poison and burning my skin. In that brief moment I had an opening and I managed to push my body against hers and the syringe plunged into her neck. I injected the poison and her eyes turned from glowing to black and dead. She collapsed on the ground beside me as I stumbled and ran from the house. I haven't stopped running ever since. The book, it is so valuable but not for just money. I believe it reveals of a secret invasion to our planet. My girlfriend is proof. I don't think the Star Princess will be dead for long if the prophecy is to turn out true. And now as I travel, in hopes of finding others who know more and can help me, I fear that I trust no one. The final notes from Kalhid told me this much. My assumption of the end of the tale was correct. Natsuno was a hybrid, but the demons of the stars were born of the princess to do her bidding and to hunt down this new land and claim it. Not just the Kono tribe, but perhaps others, even millions could be infected with this alien menace now. It had been hundreds of years, I realized as I reconsidered destroying the book. But I can't. It might be the only thing keeping me alive. This secret is too powerful to remain quiet. As a warning to others, I think it's best to realize the people of this earth are not all human. Ancient evil walks among us, and only my family has the key to possibly stopping them. If we even can. If we haven't already been found out. I say this because I also traveled to my ma, realizing that despite grandfather's warning I needed to learn more. And when I arrived at her house I found that she had experienced a break-in. And she had been murdered. Smelling her rotting flesh and seeing how these inhuman creatures tore her apart will be scarred into my memory for as long as I live. But it will also serve as a warning that I can't let my guard down. The book must be protected until I find a way to stop them. Until then I run, run, and hide. And I suggest everyone that knows this secret do the same. Kiang was the one who brought it up during one of our many late night chats. I had a run of shit luck on my previous shift, he grumbled as he lit a cigarette with his lighter. Some pretty girl flagged my taxi down along Jalan Basar after midnight, and just as I thought that I could earn back my fuel money with the fare, she just straight up vanished in the middle of the ride. Chewing on a mouthful of Nasi Lemek, I swallowed and took a sip out of my coffee. Vanished? What do you mean? Exactly what I said. He put the cigarette in between his teeth, but did not puff it immediately. I stopped at a red light, and then I heard the rear passenger door lock click open. By the time I turned my head around to glance behind me, the bitch had gone poof like magic. So, she's a fair evader, I said with a wry laugh. Not common, but it's not like they don't exist either. Why didn't you chase her down or call the police? Are you even listening? I told you, she just straight up disappeared, Kiong insisted. I swear I only stopped the car for three seconds at most. But when I checked my surroundings, it was completely empty. I was the only person in the entire intersection, you know. I was going to crack a joke, but I knew Kiong long enough to know that he wasn't the type of man to embellish his tales with such dubious claims unless he was going insane. Are you sure that you didn't see her running off somewhere? 
I asked. Have you checked your dash cam? I really, he suddenly paused and slammed his hand against the table in an aha gesture. That's right, the dash cam. Only a smart one like you will definitely come up with such an ingenious solution. That's just common sense, drinking the remaining coffee in my cup, I scraped the last bits of rice on the oil paper into my mouth and tossed the wrapper into the bin. Come on, let's go to your car. Huh? What for? The dash cam, have you forgotten? I sighed. You should be thankful that I helped you install one last month, or else you'd really be shit out of luck in this case. Aya, uh, this kind of thing, only youngsters will know how to operate them anyway, he quipped as we walked to his taxi. My generation work out such thing one. Just turn the key in the ignition, press clutch and shift gear only. As Kiong rambled on in between drags on his cigarette, I fiddled around with the dash cam until I managed to pull up the most recent footage on the tiny screen. What time did it happen? I asked, pressing the button to fast forward the video. Hmm, around 12.15, 12.20 in the morning? It happened soon after I picked her up, I think. So, it should be recorded in this part, then. I clicked the play button, and with Kiong leaning over the window to peek at the dash cam screen, we watched the footage play out. A road lined with parked cars and shop houses, lit only by the occasional yellow glow of streetlights. At the next intersection, there was a figure waving an outstretched hand slowly towards the approaching taxi. There, that's her. Kiong remarked. Let's see what happens next. Miss, where to? ZZZT, Maraz. I frowned. What is with the static noise? Rozak already? Kiong suggested. I bought it brand new, no way it'll be broken this fast. I paused the video. Where did she want to go, anyway? Jalan Kimaras, he said calmly. What, you mean the cemetery? In the dead of night? I gave him an incredulous look. You're brave for picking up such a passenger in the first place. Qingming, tomb sweeping day, is coming soon, so it is not surprising for people to go to the cemetery to tend to their family graves, he pointed out. Besides, I wear an amulet around my neck all the time, so no evil can ever harm me. Shaking my head, I resumed the video. The sound of the accelerator being pressed, accompanied by the faint cackle of static that wasn't present before. Are you doing prayers for your ancestors, miss? I, a burst of static cut off her reply. Silence for the next couple of seconds. Then, the sound of the blinker as the taxi approached an empty intersection. S, re, can you G, straight? Yeah. But miss, we'll reach Jill on cameras faster if we take the road to the left. P, A, S, E, go S, T, R, G, H, T. The sound of the blinker stopped just as the light turned red. The taxi rolled to a stop. By the way, miss, are you going alone? That's a little dangerous, you know, especially when the area isn't well lit. You should at least wear an amulet to protect yourself, like me. Suddenly, a click sounded as the door lock was released. Miss? What are you? The sound of a door being frantically opened. Miss? Miss? Where did you go? See, do you believe me now? Kiong asked, pointing at the screen. There's only wilderness at that junction. Where can a person run to? I pursed my lips and thought. If you had gone straight all the way, wouldn't you have gone onto the highway? Ah. Uh -huh. He shrugged. I'm charging by the meter anyway, so it doesn't matter as long as the fare is paid at the end. But I'm telling you, this passenger makes my blood boil. Young people like her think that we old taxi drivers are fools that can be. Thankfully, I managed to stop Kiong before he embarked on another tirade. She seems to know this area well, there is a good chance that she's a local. I'm sure that soon enough, either you or I will meet her while on the job. We can confront her together if that happens. Hmm, I can't argue with that logic. That's a deal then. Kiong patted me on my back and pulled the door open. Now, will you please get out so that I can start my shift? Hey, I'm also delaying my own shift by doing this. I had said the part about meeting the mysterious fair evader soon and confronting her together to calm Kiong down, but as fate would have it, 
it was my turn to run into bad luck on the very shift after my chat with Kiong. Strange, what day is it today? I muttered to myself under my breath as I drove along the deserted main street of the strangely quiet city. Not a single person walking on the sidewalks, not to mention any passengers. My voice trailed off as my headlights illuminated a human-like figure doing a familiar slow wave of her hand at the intersection up ahead. Instinctively, I glanced at the glowing green digits on the dashboard clock. 004. I hesitated for just a split second before slamming on the brakes. After three nerve-wracking rings, Keong finally picked up the phone. Yes? I should probably touch wood, but I think I found the lady you're looking for. The next moment, there was the sound of tires screeching in the background. Where are you? You pick her up and I'll tell you. Drive straight to the police post if she gives you any trouble, got it? I relayed my location to him, and keeping him on the call with his voice muted, I slowly inched towards the waiting passenger. No wonder Keong described her as a pretty girl, that was my first impression as I stopped the car and rolled down the passenger side window. Soft, hazel-colored hair that fell in silky waves down slender shoulders. A pair of dark brown, almost black eyes met mine with the faintest of smiles that made my heart flutter. Miss, where are you headed? I asked, my throat suddenly feeling a lot drier than usual. Her unblinking eyes stared back at me silently. Then without warning, she opened the passenger rear door and sat on the back seat in a smooth motion. The N.O. Temple, she said in a voice bordering on whisper. Okay. I shot a glance at my phone, making sure that my call with Keong was still connected. At the very least, the temple wasn't far from the main street, and though I wasn't really the superstitious type, I was definitely relieved to be staying in the city instead of driving to the cemetery on the outskirts of town. Sorry, but can you go straight instead? Her whispery voice startled me. Straight? I looked at the approaching intersection. But miss, I have to make a U-turn to go to the temple. I've changed my mind. Please, go straight. I gripped the steering wheel tightly. Miss, I'm telling you that. It was as if I had abruptly lost control of the car at that moment. I blinked in surprise, and the next thing I knew, we were already past the intersection and driving out of the town center. Barely able to register what had just happened, I frantically glanced at the rearview mirror and stared right into the lady's unmoving eyes. And miss, we have to turn back. Please, go straight, she repeated her pale lips hardly moving as she spoke. A shiver ran down my spine, and to my fright, my foot stomped on the gas without warning. We flew past the next few intersections, all of them turning green in my favor eerily at the same time. Within less than a minute, we were reaching the T-junction at the end of the road, and the sign for the highway appeared in the fast nearing distance. Miss, I managed to utter in between panic gasps as I looked at the rearview mirror again. W. We can't go straight any further. She didn't reply, but her head was twisted to the right as if she was craning her neck to catch a glimpse of something along the highway running perpendicular to the road. I guess we're turning all right, then. An invisible pressure pressing upon my body released its chokehold at that moment, and somehow I was able to control the steering wheel and brake just enough to make a wide right turn onto the highway. Driver, the lady's voice spoke into my ear all of a sudden. What the? I had flinched, and the car nearly drove over the median before I wrestled control over the steering wheel again. She gave me a look of disapproval, of all things. When you see a fallen telephone pole along the road, please pull over and stop the car immediately, she continued, her voice fading to a bare whisper. I'm counting on you, to find. Miss? Sorry, I couldn't catch what you... I glanced up at the rearview mirror one last time, and just as Kiong had described, the lady was gone without a trace. One hand gripping the steering wheel tightly, I quickly unmuted the call on my phone. Kiong, did you catch that? Ah. Uh, catch what? He shouted back. All I could hear for the past five minutes was static. Where are you now? Ah, uh, it looks like I'm on the highway heading towards Guamizang. The highway? Yeah. W wait a minute. Catching sight of a telephone pole which had collapsed into a ditch by the roadside, I quickly switched on my hazard lights and pulled over. This far out from the city, there were no street lights along the road, 
so I had to rely on my car headlights and the screen of my phone to navigate my way to the edge of the ditch. Huh, what's that on the ground? I froze as the light from my phone shone upon a smashed car bumper. Kiam, can you hear me? What's wrong? W, W, we need to call the police. You have a lovely night now. Drive safe. Paul, the manager who takes over my shift at the Enwater Lodge, yelled to the back of my head as the front door was sliding shut with a small hiss behind me. He never knew to watch his volume past 7 p.m. It's a small lodge, your voice travels throughout the entire building. Instead of heading back into lightly chastised sweet Paul like I normally would as a general manager, I just rolled my eyes and made the short walk to my car. It was a Friday before a very busy weekend, the lodge was packed and the guests were full of on-on-vacation wine coolers. They were loud, mean, and impatient. But my unusual double shift was over, and all I could think about was my bed. Normally someone else took the afternoon shift on Fridays, but everyone but Paul and I was out sick that week. So I worked the morning to late evening, the first time I had ever done so in my years of working here. My schedule was the only one that didn't change, it had stayed pretty consistent after I had been promoted, one of the only perks of being the GM. The drive home didn't take long, a quick ten minutes through the densely populated suburbs that surrounded the lodge. This apartment was in the perfect location, a gift brought to me on one silver, now patinated platter. Coming upon the apartment that night, I could feel the unease building in my stomach as I looked into the dark windows. Before living there I had lived with my parents, but they had informed me that I had a couple of months to find a place as they were moving to their final resting grounds. Florida I worked at the lodge nonstop for weeks, picking up extra shifts so that in the event an apartment came into my sights I could afford it. The listing practically found me, a flyer had been posted to the bulletin outside the lodge. A perfect little two-story for a very cheap monthly price. It had space for a craft room, allowed pets, and had a pull-in garage. No street parking for my old Buick. It was the perfect place for me, so I scheduled a walkthrough within five minutes of viewing the listing. I heard back in seconds. The viewing went perfectly, the landlord loved me and seemed quite desperate to have someone fill the vacancy. Either I was the only one who reached out about the listing, or he had a hard time keeping someone here. I could feel that he was buttering me up as we walked through, so I knew the catch was coming. The catch did, right at the end as I was about to sign the lease, in the form of house noises. That's literally what my landlord called them. House noises. He kept reiterating that it had to be the house settling, or the water heater clicking, or maybe it was the plumbing. It had been happening since he took on the property, and there wasn't any explanation for it. He's had pest control, inspectors, and plumbers check every part of the house. They found nothing. He even showed me documentation that they had inspected the place. Reading through they seemed just as confused as the landlord. Taking one look at the rent prices in any other place, I told him I had good noise-canceling headphones and that I'd take it. I can deal with house noises as long as the thing isn't going to fall on me. It definitely wasn't going to fall in, the house was solid, I could see that just from looking at it. It was built in the 40s, a craftsman-style house in the middle of modern prefabs. I had my father who has a history in construction take a look at it, and he said the same thing as the others. A beautiful house with a strong foundation. The noises persisted, even after confirming that they shouldn't. They started out small, a scratch and a creak every now and then. An odd noise from the basement, a small pitter-patter in the attic. I blamed the house settling, mice and the hot water heater for as long as I could, but after a while I couldn't reasonably blame the house. The red flags were waving so persistently, but I couldn't bear leaving this gem of an apartment. I also couldn't leave the stray cat I was feeding. I had never seen it with my own eyes, but I kept finding mangled mice in my backyard. In hopes of getting it to stop leaving corpses everywhere, I started leaving out a bowl of kibble every night. And every morning it was left sparkling clean, every last pebble eaten. I thought the cat was thankful for a meal it wouldn't have to chase, but it still left corpses all over. Insatiable. I kept feeding it, hoping one day it would stop. So I learned to try and coexist with the sounds. Only one event was ever really concerning at the time. I was getting ready to take on a last-minute afternoon to evening shift. 
Someone had asked to switch shifts last minute the night before, so I slept in through my normal morning shift. I was brushing away my late morning breath when I heard something move across my attic. A long drag of something heavy being pushed across the uneven floorboards. I heard it catch and fumble, as if it caught on something, and then I heard it resettle back onto the attic floor. I grabbed my phone and went to stand on my sidewalk while I waited for the police, dialing 911 before I even made it out of the house, slamming the front door harder than I meant to in my rush to get out. They made it in minutes, searching the house, the attic, and the basement, but there was no one there. I went up with them to the attic after they came down with nothing to report and found exactly what they found. Nothing. Nothing had been moved in the attic. I started to think I imagined the whole thing. While searching for the intruder in the small attic space, I noticed some odd markings on a dresser that was here when I moved in. Five small mold spots sat like fingerprints on the corner. The only thing different were out of place since the last time I was up here. There were no leaks or reasons for the furniture to get moldy, but the spots were present nonetheless. I cleaned them with bleach water and notified my landlord. They were still present, but small after I scrubbed at them. The landlord was still in the process of hiring someone to clean it. There hadn't been any other sounds like that, but smaller noises continued. I was trying to pretend that they didn't bother me, but it wasn't working. I couldn't afford rent anywhere else, so I moved on as best as I could. Leaving the lodge that night, the tiredness sat heavy behind my eyes. I let the unease sit in my stomach. No sense in fighting it. Once I was in bed, the comforter bundled around me. Even the noises couldn't penetrate the feeling of safety. I slept heavy and that night I knew I would be gone to the world before my head hit the pillow. The process of parking my car, unlocking my door, and throwing my work bag down was branded into my muscles at that point. Before I knew it I was stripped down to my underwear, leaving my work clothes in the hallway to wash the next day, and then I was making my way up the stairs to my bedroom. Turning at the top of the stairs I took in the side of my bedroom door, the feeling of unease was blaring in my stomach now, present all over my skin. My bedroom door was closed. I hadn't closed my door when I left. I never did. My body cautiously took me to the door without me asking. My hand reached for the handle like a magnet to metal. My palm touching the smooth cold is what awoke me out of my stupor, taking my hand away the thoughts started to spiral behind my tired eyes. I should go down to my car and call the police. I should go back to the lodge and have Paul come search the house with me. I should call my dad. Before I knew it my hand was back on the door handle, and I was pulling it to the side with the softest of clicks, taking caution in a house that only I should occupy. I needed to see what had been plaguing me in this house for months, and I just knew the answer was in there. Something deep in me said to look upon this with only your eyes, and for some reason I listened. I let the door follow its natural path to the wall but stopped it before it swung open fully. My eyes immediately fell to the bed, the only thing out of place in my dark room, the outside lamppost light illuminated my small room enough for me to take in the figure laying under my pale yellow comforter. There was someone in my bed. The first thing that hit me was the smell, a heat was present in my room that had never been there before. The smell of rot, festering and hitting my nose, coiling and almost causing me to gag out loud. The smell of cat food lingered in the air, it was an unmistakable smell. I followed the figure with wide eyes, starting at the gray feet hanging off the end of my bed. My sheets barely covered their ankles, the sharp bones protruding and cutting against the pale paper-thin skin. The sound of gruff breaths took over the static in my ears. Long, raspy chokes filled the space between me and them, making my skin crawl whenever their breath would hitch and gurgle out. My eyes found their back, they returned to me, oblivious to the fact the owner of the house returned. Their back was covered in the same pale gray skin I had seen on their ankles, but it was pockmarked with odd black spots that stood out so harshly against their backdrop. My mind immediately thought of the black spots in my attic, the spread was the same. I could see the bumps of their spine and the tips of their shoulder blades, they looked like they would slash right through the thin skin. Their spine was bent, hunched unnaturally and at such a severe angle. Spindly hair covered the head that was turned away from me, Greasy and matted to the back of its skull, chunks missing in spots leaving nothing but pale rotted skin in its place. The hair that was left around the bald spots was long enough to trail across my white sheets like an oil spill. 
The black spots were spreading off their back and onto my sheets, reaching all the way down to the side where my mattress and box spring met. Eating whatever it could find. This person, this thing, filled my bed like they owned it. I needed to leave. With all of my willpower, I started to back away from the threshold, never letting my eyes leave the sleeping figure. I brought my hand up to find the wall, letting it be my guide back to the top of the stairs. I was only a couple of steps away from the top stair when my hand caught on something hanging on the wall. A picture frame holding me and my father at my graduation. I had just placed it on the wall a couple of days ago, trying to bring comfort to this odd place. It started to swing back and forth, a perfect pendulum, scraping against the drywall and echoing in the silent house. I could both hear and see the figure stirring. Their breath had caught in their throat, hacking its way out of their mouth with a wet guttural sound. It sounded exactly like the noise I thought the water heater was making, but now I could hear how unnatural it sounded. I don't know how I ever convinced myself it was a manufactured noise. I could see their arms pushing them up from the nest they had made, could hear their bones cracking and clicking. They were turning and turning, a large long unnatural bend until their eyes met mine. Deep set eyes peered out from between the strands of long hair, sat above sunken starf cheeks and a long skeletal nose. The whites of their eyes took over, a cloud of milky white that bled across where their pupils were supposed to sit. The same deep black marks present on their back covered their face, spreading across their cheeks and nose, digging into their skin and eating at the flesh they were covering. Their mouth hung open like a scream, stuck in a mimicry of horror. Their jaw swung on the same pendulum my picture frame had found, like it wasn't attached to their skull. Hanging on by ligaments and muscle, thin skin stretching and spreading to keep it present. The scream that released from me was unbidden, but it set off an important switch in my head. The switch to run, the need to flee. Turning I stumbled my way down the stairs. I heard an odd muffled screech of something behind me, closer than I wanted it to be. It almost sounded like my name. A contorted version, but the syllables were there. It made me run faster, fumbling down the steps as quickly as I could. I pushed my way off the wall at the bottom of the stairs, sending my body careening toward the front door. Not thinking, I ran straight past my work bag and clothes. It wasn't until I was by the garage door that I thought about the keys sitting near the front door. Turning back the door was still wide open, but the thing wasn't there. Instead of thinking any more about it, I ripped my eyes away and took off down the street. My brain thought of the nearest safe haven, and my feet automatically took me to the lodge. Without looking back I sprinted down the dimly lit streets, my feet screaming as they hit the uneven hard sidewalks. I heard a muffled screech again, but it was far away, contained in that house. I could almost feel that it stopped following me after I made it out the front door, but I wasn't going to let feelings overtake logic. I wasn't going to stop until I was inside somewhere that wasn't my apartment or the outdoors. It felt like an eternity, but finally, my eyes met the fluorescent lights leaking out of the sconces by the front of the lodge. My fists found the front door first, slamming like they could break through the keycard lock metal. Paul's white eyes met mine, taking in my almost naked appearance and ushering me in. He found a thin comforter in the back room for me to cover myself with and sat with me holding my cold hands until the police arrived. Paul had called them, but they had already been called by my neighbors. Some had even seen me running down the sidewalk, awoken by the odd screeching they heard. I never even thought to slam on their doors. I had just wanted to get away from that house. To get to some place I trusted. With the police present, I started in on what I had seen. Paul listened as I told the story of what I found in my bed. If my mind were in a different space, I would have known to omit certain details, details that made the entire thing sound impossible. I took in the faces of the men listening to me after I finished with my story and could tell Paul was the only one who believed me, who actually took in the words I was saying. Three of the policemen left to search my house and the area for a deranged homeless man, leaving one policeman to keep watch with Paul and I at the lodge. They found nothing. They searched the house from top to bottom and found no one. They found my spotted bed sheets, the twisted mess of comfort the stranger left for me, my clothes and work bag. They found everything I had mentioned, but no sign of anyone. Paul led me to a vacant room, checking all the nook and crannies for a pale man I asked him to. Paul came in late the next day to wake me, knowing that I hadn't slept a wink. 
He had checked on me so many times throughout the night and morning, peeking in to check on my form but meeting my unsleeping eyes every time. He brought me breakfast and notified me that the police were back to ask me more questions. I had them come to the room to talk, not feeling like having this chat in the busy lobby. We discussed my story again, me reiterating the same information I told them the night before. They must have expected a different story, but I knew I had seen and didn't want to lie to make others more comfortable. They told me there wasn't much they could do since they didn't find the suspect, but that they would put out a bolo for a man matching that description, and that they would have someone sit outside my house for a few weeks. I told them I would not be living there anymore, I would only return to get my stuff. The only thing I asked of them is that they destroyed my bedding as I didn't want to see it upon my return, and that they were present while I packed up my stuff. They sat outside on the front stoop while Paul and I messily packed up my things. I had called my landlord and left a voicemail with him about what had happened, but he never returned my calls. While packing up the odds and ends in my bedroom and the adjacent hallway, I noticed that the picture frame I had bumped into was gone. I looked all over the hallway, asked Paul if he had grabbed it and he said no, stating that he hadn't seen a frame there to grab. After searching for a while I decided it didn't matter. Before I left, I felt called to the attic. To the dresser covered in spots. I guess I felt the need to verify it, that the mold was real and I hadn't imagined it. I'm still not sure why I went up there, to be honest. I remember painstakingly scrubbing at those spots, there wasn't any need for verification. But my whole body said to visit that space one more time. Paul followed me up without asking, which I was very grateful for. Walking toward the dresser my foot found an odd board. When my foot sat directly in the middle of it, the other side of the board clunked against the bottom of the dresser. Standing on either side of the board didn't move it, the pressure had to be applied right in the middle. I had never noticed it before, it was always flush with the floor while I was up here, airtight to the joists below. When asked, Paul helped me move the dresser away from the odd board. Pushing again on the middle, the board gave way, wiggling out of its tight space. Without the dresser there to stop it, Paul and I slide the board aside with ease. Once moved the smell of rot and cat food filled the small attic space. My eyes watered immediately, my lungs sucking the fragrance into my nose, leaving me gagging. I heard Paul stagger backward, and when I turned to check on him he was holding the wall to try and steady himself. Sitting below the joists, above the ceiling panels, and underneath the floors we were standing on, was my picture frame. Mine and my father's face was smiling back at me, mold dotting the glass surrounding our faces. The floor around the frame was covered completely in mold, the black taking up so much of the space that I couldn't even see the ceiling panels anymore. Small corpses of mice were decomposing into the mold, bones poking out of the black, a quick meal for the void to take. With my hand covering my nose, I slammed the board back into place and pushed Paul toward the entrance of the attic. I told the police about what I had found, what conclusion I had decided on, and left. I haven't heard back from them since the last time I called a couple of days ago. They stopped answering my calls after a while, not wanting to listen to deranged tellings of a man eating mice in walls. So I left them with the house, left them in the past, and tried to start the process of healing. Three weeks later I find myself here, in Paul's guest room. The entirety of my things packed and slid to the side, sans bedding and picture frame. I'll be living here until I can find a new place, or until I feel comfortable to go out on my own again. Paul stated I could be his new roommate, and I'm thinking more and more about taking that offer. I don't know if I could ever live by myself again. Although, I wasn't ever really living by myself now, was I? Everything was going as okay as it could, considering the circumstances. Each day I could feel my paranoia lessen, each day I felt more like myself. Even Paul and I were starting to get closer, eating dinner with him most nights was starting to be something I looked forward to. Things were getting better. They were really starting to look up. Tonight when I returned from my shift at the lodge Paul was sitting on the couch, eating leftover stir fry that I made the night before. I rushed up the stairs to change into comfier clothes, ready to have some stir fry and complain to Paul about the guests of the day. Reaching over my head to put my oversized night shirt on my eyes followed the side wall up to the ceiling over my bed, foggily grazing where the paint met the ceiling. In an instant, the fog cleared when my eyes met small pock marks. Black spots of mold were starting to spread across the ceiling like stars. 